Peace, grace, and mercy be multiplied to you from God, from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In our text this morning, God is promising a great thing. There'll be plenty of good food to eat and plenty of good wine to drink. There'll be a time of complete peace and happiness. People will live forever, for death has been swallowed up. But, as you read other parts of the Bible, you realize that there's other things there too. For a man that is born of a woman is full of trouble. His days are short. He is like a flower. He comes and he withers. He's like a shadow. He continues now. Knowing this, experiencing this, we know that this text is not speaking of a golden day for Israel in their lifetime, nor is it speaking about a golden day for us in our lifetime, but rather this is a prophecy for the new kingdom for which we pray so often, thy kingdom come. St. John explains Isaiah so beautifully in Revelation 21, there we read, and then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and mourning and death shall be no more. For the former things have passed away. And he who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new again. And he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water from the fountain of the water of life. He who conquers shall have this heritage. I will be his God, and he shall be my child. On this mountain, there was a mountain called Sinai, where the Lord gave us the Ten Commandments. And while that wasn't a feast of wine and fat meats, it was intended, first of all, for his own people, Israel, but secondly, for all mankind. So much is this for all mankind that St. Paul said it is written on our hearts. But then there was another mountain called Calvary. There the Lord worked out his salvation. For God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, no longer counting our sins and trespasses against us, but committing to us the word of reconciliation. Reconciling the world. On this mountain the Lord will make for all peoples, it doesn't say his people as for Israel, but all peoples, meaning also the Gentiles, that means you and I. That means we have been committed to the message of reconciliation. And then there's another mountain. In Matthew 28 we read, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the close of the age. This is the Great Commission. And what's the first word? Go! Luke has a different side of the story. It says that two angels came to the eleven as they were standing there. And this is the Denver translation of the Greek. Why are you standing there with your hands in your pockets and your heads in the cloud? There's work to be done, so go and get busy. It's not literal, but it'll do. <laughs> now, while we are waiting for Revelation 21 to take place, there's a lot for us to do. There's the go of the Great Commission. There's the message of reconciliation. There are people in your sphere of influence and in mine who do not know or believe the gospel. 
We want to spend eternity with them, but the way things stand now, that's not going to happen. We've got a work to do. We've got to go. We've got to share the word of reconciliation. Then there's the lonely, the sick, the aged, the shut in, the discouraged, that could well use a visit from you and from me. There's the hungry to feed, the homeless to shelter. And yes, there are prayers and ministries. What did Jesus say? I was in prison and you visited me. There are prayers and ministries where we can help people to get on the straight and narrow. There are the Ten Commandments for us to live a God-pleasing life as an example for ourselves and as well as for those outside the faith. The commandments help us to be better people as well as to serve our neighbor. These can cause you and I to pray in our evening prayer, I have walked with God today. But while we want to lead a God-pleasing life, we dare not trust in anything we will do to save ourselves or to get closer to God. He has already come very close to us in word and sacrament. He took on our flesh and redeemed us. It's not what we do. For it is by grace that you are saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone would boast. Now there's a hint in our text of a feast, and we can enjoy that here and now. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make a feast for all people. When Jesus turned water into wine, what do they say? This is the very best. What about the bread and the wine that is offered to us today? In the gospel, in at least three places, it says, Take, eat, this is my body. Take, drink, this is my flesh. Give it and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. St. Paul interprets this for us unless we think it's allegorical or just figuratively. The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of the Lord? The cup which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of the Lord? And we read further, and he will destroy on the mountain the covering that is cast over the peoples, the veil that is spread over all the nations. What happened on that mountain that changed the veil? In Matthew we read, now from the sixth hour there was a darkness over the land until the ninth hour. And about on the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama makshani, that means my God. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of the people hearing it said, He's calling for Elijah. One of them ran at once and took a sponge, filled it with vinegar, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. Well, I said, Wait, let's see if Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and he yielded his spirit. And behold, the temple of the current. Of the, the, cur the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The veil, the, the veil separating man from God is gone. We have access to our Father through our mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is seated at the right hand of the Father, who indeed intercedes for us. So in the meantime, there's this hymn. Now, if you don't know it. But Gary, I'll bet you do. And anybody else with a Baptist background. <laughs> Jesus has set a table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites his chosen people to come and dine. With his manna he doth feed and supplies our every need. Oh, tis sweet to sup with Jesus all the time. And then the refrain. Gary, you know this? Come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. To the hungry calleth now, come and dine. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.